Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Eliza Hill. I'm with the Frederick County Public Libraries. Welcome to our Women's History Month Women's Author Panel Discussion. In a moment, I will have each of our authors introduce themselves. But first, I wanted to remind viewers that this program is being recorded and it will be available at a later date on both FCPL's website and on its Facebook page. Also, most of the books that these author, from these authors are available through the library catalog or for purchase from our community partner, The Curious Iguana. All viewers are muted, so if you have a question, please place it in the Q&A field if you are watching this through Zoom or in the comments section of, if you are watching on Facebook. My colleague will be monitoring those sections and we will leave time at the end to cover them. Ladies, thank you for joining us today. Now let's get started. Okay, we're gonna start with um, introductions. Um, I'd like each of you to give a short background on yourself and talk about how you got started writing. Is the genre that you are currently known for where you began or have you moved around? And if so, why? Would anyone like to offer to start? Stephanie, would you like to go ahead? You're first on my, uh, on my list here. <laughs> Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Stephanie Dre, New York Times bestselling co-author of America's First Daughter and My Dear Hamilton. Uh, my newest book is called The Women of Chateau Lafayette, which is coming out on the 30th. I write historical women's fiction, so I'm very excited about Women's History Month, and I'm excited to be here and thankful to the library for having us. Um, I did not start in this genre. Um, well, actually, let me back up just slightly. I did start in this genre. I really wanted to write the story of Cleopatra's daughter, but um, no one wanted to publish it at first. So I, I started writing some other things, including fantasy and romance. But eventually, um, someone did want to publish my series on Cleopatra's daughter, and that's when I started expanding into uh, other eras with the help of my very dear friend and co-author, Laura Kamoy. Great, well, good, wonderful. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Mindy, would you like to go next? Absolutely. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Eliza, for uh, hosting us today. This is a really fun event and I've been looking forward to it for several weeks now. Um, I, uh, my name is Mindy Klasky. Um, I have written in just about every genre that exists. Um, I started out writing traditional fantasy novels, um, those sort of um, Harry Potter, but for grownups type books. Um, I proceeded to write um, some uh, chiclet books like Bridget Jones's Diary, um, but mine was about a witch who, a, a librarian who finds out that she's a witch as opposed to a witch who finds out that she's a librarian. Um, and um, I wrote several uh, books, several series in that version of Washington DC, which is a magical Washington. Um, I've written psychological thrillers. I've written contemporary romances about baseball players. Um, and my most recent book is called The C Word. Um, it is a contemporary romantic comedy um, but I think that it fits into this discussion of historical fiction because it is very specifically tied to very specific times. It is uh, set between March and June of 2020 okay. um, as uh, the COVID outbreak begins. And it's about how a couple finds true love even in the most challenging of times. Wonderful, thank you so much, Mindy. Um, Kira, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, I am Kira Decker. Um, I also write as uh, Tony Decker. I co-wrote um, my current series. And um, I'm a little bit different than everybody else here. I don't specifically write historical fiction, but I write paranormal romance, but I pull a lot of my ideas from history. And one of the things that I do in my, my paranormal thing is I look back at um, an immortal who has moved through history and how he's interacted with history. And I use art as kind of the medium through to do this. And he, he pretends to be different artists throughout time. So I like looking back at these kind of historical art things and going, what if, what can I do differently about this? And that's kind of how I've started to do. I also write in fantasy. 
Um, those aren't published yet, but I, I pull on medieval. Medieval age is kind of my fascination. And, but I like mixing sci-fi in with it as well. So I kind of still write in both. And that's where I started. That's where my roots were with science fiction and fantasy and kind of went from there, but I love it. You're muted, Eliza. Eliza, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that's it. I Thank should you. have been. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Denny, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, my name is Denny S. Bryce. Um, I am the newbie of the group here. My debut novel, which is a historical fiction, as you can see the big posters behind me. Some of you might be able to see that. Um, I'm sorry, my phone has the tendency to go off and I can't figure <laughs> out how to turn it off. Anywho, um, I am, uh, my book is Wild Women in the Blues, set in a uh, dual storyline set in 1925 Chicago, as well as 200 and 2015 Chicago. I'm very excited about just finally after maybe 10 years hanging around authors and going to conferences, and it's probably more than 10, but that's all I'm going to admit to. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, now working on my second book and I have uh, some future contracts, all historical fiction, just all over the place. Um, American, uh, African-American historical fiction, or I should say African-American main characters in my historical fiction. And then um, I'm also writing historical fiction um, that is focused more on um, uh, Africa, West Africa, London, Britain, uh, with another series, or not a series, a book I'm writing. And the only other thing I can add is I got started writing with fan fiction. I wrote Buffy Spike, fan fiction, which is the best fan fiction. <laughs> and, um, and right now I also write book reviews for National Public Radio. And I'm gonna go on <laughs> mute because this call seems to be urgent. <laughs> great, thank you, Denny, I appreciate it. Um, okay, great, you're mu muted. Okay, Laura, would you like to go next? Absolutely. Hello everyone, my name is Laura Kamoy and I am the author of several novels of historical fiction, um, all of which have been co-authored um, to some degree uh, by the lovely Stephanie Dre, who is also part of our event today. And um, I, um, I write uh, in several genres. Um, I write historical fiction as um, this name, Laura Kamoy, and I also write romance and suspense as Laura Kay. Um, I actually started writing fiction first in romance and suspense. I'm uh, an historian by training. Um, until 2015, I was um, employed as an associate professor of history at the United States Naval Academy. Um, so that was my day, day job, and romance and suspense were sort of my fun other thing um, that I enjoyed doing. Um, and then there became a point where my romance writing really became successful and I found myself really needing to make a, a choice between continuing to teach full time or really being able to pursue the opportunities that I was starting to um, have in, um, in writing fiction. And so I made a giant leap of faith and I left my tenured uh, job at the Naval Academy to become a full-time writer. And once I was no longer um, writing uh, or doing history as my day job, then I began to look at um, writing historical uh, novels. And uh, that was what um, ultimately helped provide the inspiration for um, America's First Daughter. So that was how I came to historical fiction. Wonderful, thank you, Laura. And uh, lastly, we have Rita. Rita, are you there? Rita was having some technical difficulties. I don't think we have her at the moment. Okay, um, hopefully we can cut when she gets her tech issues worked out, we can come back um, to Rita. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and start in with the questions. Um, if you would like, I will just open it up for anyone to answer. Um, the first question that we have, why do you believe that historical fiction or historical romances 
appeal to so many people. Who would like to take the question first? Oh, Denny, you're muted. Denny, you're muted. <laughs> Um, I can't turn off my phone. Um, I'd say that um, I'll, I'll start with historical romance. Um, I think that the increased interest in historical romance has to do with a Netflix series uh, by the name of Bridgerton and um, a young actor named Ray J. Mm -hmm. so, uh, <laughs> so that is a near reason for that uh, increased attention. I think that reading overall has increased during the pandemic and what we're seeing, what we're experiencing, what I'm excited about is that um, reading across genres has become something that people are just doing more readily than they've done before. So that's very exciting to me. I think that in um, in these unprecedented times, um, readers are also looking for an escape, and I think uh, historical romance can be can be not always, but can be on the lighter side and, and offer that escape. But even the um, the darker historical women's fiction gives people an escape to another world where they're worrying about someone else's problems, not their own. And oftentimes those problems are worse than what we're experiencing now. So it helps buoy them a little bit to realize that people have faced worse things in the past and have survived them. So we are seeing a little bit of a renaissance of historical women's fiction in general, whether it be romance or literary fiction or commercial historicals. And I think that's fantastic. So I'm, I'm very proud to help provide an escape and perspective during these times. And I'd also say that I think historical fiction is generally um, is generally popular because history tells us where we've been and it tells us a lot about who we are. Um, and I think that what historical fiction does for people who are interested in in the past, but maybe not always like history in history classes or history in the more serious um, nonfiction history is it makes it accessible and it gives you characters that help make it um, understandable and that help bring it all to life. And so I think historical fiction is really fascinating to write because it, it is a bit of an evergreen um, genre for in terms of reader interest. Um, but I think that Denny and Stephanie are right that there are some things more recently that have probably even increased readers' interest in it. I, I agree with that whole thing that everybody's been saying is that there's something familiar about the past and with everything that's been happening, nobody quite knows what's going to happen. And so I think delving into the past, it's familiar, but then you have artists and authors that can take this familiar and maybe change it a little bit and maybe make it better than it was originally or something like that, make it more diverse, whatever it may be, so that people can escape, but if they're also escaping into something that's familiar at the same time, and that's comforting. And I, I think that may also help to why this, this revival has been really coming, and I love it. I, I absolutely love it, seeing these historical incidents, but maybe they got changed, and hey, I have the power, I changed this, I made it better somehow. And I think people kind of are enjoying that. I think on a very personal note, I started reading historical fiction because I am a painfully slow reader. And so I could read a histor historical fiction book and feel that it was worth the time that I was investing in it. I was learning something and getting my vitamins along with my entertainment. Um, and then what I found is that um, the stories that were being told were so rich and had so much application to daily life um, that it made it all the more worthwhile. Um, I, I do a lot of my reading um, for what I need to read to write, you know, what, what is being published in contemporary romantic comedies, that sort of thing. But the my personal choice when I'm picking up a book just for me is always historical fiction, sometimes historical romance, but always historical.
Okay. Um, <clears throat> so a Regency title that Chris read recently had this quote, men hold the power in this world. How do you write characters to be the antithesis of this? Where do you look for inspiration for strong female characters? Will recent events in history, especially women's history, influence your storylines or characters? That's a tough one because there are approaches that you can take. Be, um, that Regency quote, for example, that's a time when um, there were so many laws and um, rules of the day that um, made it close to impossible for women to as have their freedoms. And um, one of the things that uh, Regency does in an interesting way is show how women manipulate the situation that they are in to achieve whatever goals they want to accomplish. Um, with my characters, for example, in Wild Women in the Blues, my main characters, my protagonist, my female protagonist, um, their struggles are multi-layered. It's not only do they have to adhere to or to find a way around the issues of the man being in charge of so many of the situations that they're involved in, but there are also, um, there's racial issues, segregation, uh, limitations that are more so society's perspective during uh, the early part of um, the 1920s in Chicago's Black Belt where the, the backstory takes place. So there are different ways of looking at that statement that I think a lot of historical fiction writers in particular use that to create conflict and also to give their um, female protagonist, protagonist agency. So they're gonna say, I'm, I'm not gonna abide by that particular mindset or rule or what have you. It's very boring. It's very boring to read about people who have everything given to them and get it very easily and then just move. There isn't any conflict there. And so I think that part of what we do as authors is look at people who are creating their own way. And that may be women in historical periods. Um, in uh, my fantasy novels, it's people in a caste system where um, in the world of the glass rites, um, they are born into a specific caste and must follow the social rules of that caste. Um, and it gives us a way of looking at characters doing extraordinary things, because that's far more interesting than the got up, made breakfast, sat down, drank my cup of coffee. We, we, we don't need to read about that. Um, we have a question uh, for the panel. Um, the question comes from Terry, and Terry would like to know, do you do your own research or do you outsource it? <laughs> The, the research rabbit hole is a very, very deep thing. <laughs> um, I have a blast doing my research and, uh, well, okay, I'll give you an instance because it's sitting right here. For my medieval stuff, I actually am reading an illustrated book on medieval herbs because I want to know how they work and how can I use them and things like this. It might only take two pages in my book, but I want to make it real. I want to make it authentic. And I, I love doing my own research. It's fun. I did my own research, um, I, including visiting the places for the Windmill Chateau Lafayette. Uh, I, I went to France and I went to, the, to see Lafayette's birthplace and his castle in Auvergne. So jealous. I, I absolutely, <laughs> this is my absolute favorite thing to do. It's, it's when the book is shiniest and most exciting when you haven't ruined anything yet, you haven't put any words down and you're still doing all the research, that is great. I will say though, that one of the great benefits of co-authoring a book is that you get to outsource just a little bit. So I'll hand it over to Laura now. <laughs> yes, uh, definitely enjoy doing all of my own research. And uh, another great thing about having a co-author is that you can take those research trips with a friend and um, and call it work. Uh, and so Stephanie and I, I, I did not, one of my jealousies about the Women of Chateau Lafayette, which is an absolutely phenomenal book, um, is that uh, since we did not co-author that one, I had no good justification for going to France with Stephanie. 
Um, but in our research for um, our American Founding Mothers books, you know, we we went to Monticello together. We went to um, Patsy's husband's uh, plantation, Tuckahoe, together. Um, for my dear Hamilton, we went to um, New York City and um, did research at the New York Historical Society and the New York Public Library. And then we went up to Albany and um, did research there and visited the Schuyler Mansion. Um, and so uh, I think that um, for me, at least, uh, I don't know that I could outsource um, my research because you really need to feel, at least I do, need to feel immersed in the material so that you said so that you know what's available for you to use in any given scene. And a lot of the times you don't even fully know exactly what it is you're going to need to know until you're writing the specific chapter and all of a sudden you need to know, well, what crop grows in this month and what would the dinnerware on the table have been like and what would the fabric of her dress have looked like? And, and those details that actually evoke the era and bring things to life, sometimes you can't predict those details until you're actually in the middle of the writing. So you couldn't really easily outsource some of that. Um, but yeah, it's, it definitely is some of the fun part of writing historical fiction. Yeah, I can't even imagine outsourcing um, some of the research um, process. Some of my process was to spend quite a bit of time with archivists at the Harold Washington Library in Chicago. Um, I lived in Chicago for a long time, so that helped because I could just go on a walking tour, which they have in the city that goes through either the architecture or just uh, where all of the uh, hot blue spots were and are um, around town and in different communities. Another resource that I love that I think is, I don't know if it's underutilized, but ask a librarian. That is so fabulous. And especially with the Library of Congress. Um, I live in Savannah now, so I don't have as much access to the Library of Congress, none. Um, but um, Ask a Librarian online, absolutely fabulous response. And, and I worked as a librarian. For, I'm sorry, Denny. Oh, no, it's just a fabulous resource. And I just love it. <laughs> Um, I worked as a librarian for many years before I became a full-time writer. Um, and I think that to some extent that colors my somewhat different approach to research than everybody else on this panel. Um, I do much more of the sort of spot research that Laura was describing, mm -hmm. um, where all of a sudden you discover you need to know uh, what plant is blooming in the garden in March, or, yeah, March right now, um, and um, you know, go out and do that specific research. Um, as I'm actually writing, I leave lots of blanks and um, go back and fill them in later so that I don't disrupt the flow of the words, um, but can figure out what that place setting is going to look like, what those clothes are going to look like, um, those details, um, and uh, to keep the book moving forward, even though I haven't completed the research yet. One of the things that I also did with Wild Women in the Blues uh, was listen to a lot of 1920s blues. And um, that I did for a couple of reasons, not just because uh, I wanted to become uh, more familiar with the sounds, but also the lyrics. The lyrics gave me a key, if you will, to dialogue. Um, what were some of the, um, even though lyrics always, you know, a combination of poetry and just a little bit of flavor from uh, the time period that I thought was really helpful. It was definitely helpful for me to hear Chicago in the 1920s. Well, it also brings out when you hear things like that, it also brings out of what issues were they dealing with with that particular time because those tend to come out in the music a lot because music was a big way of fighting injustice or fighting specific issues. So I, I use music a lot as well. Jenny, I'm curious, do you have any favorites, favorite musicians or favorite songs from that time period? Um, actually, I do. Um, um, what, I won't name the songs because I, my brain is not doing that right now, but one of my favorite musicians who makes an appearance in the book is a lady named Alberta Hunter. 
And not to give away my age, but um, I met Alberta Hunter when she was in her 80s. Um, I was a um, baby dancer, professional dancer in New York. And I worked at a place called The Cookery. And she was the entertainment and uh, the, the cookery was owned by a man named Barney Jacobson who owned Cafe Society in the 20s. He was very elderly. And um, so he would bring in all of his friends and Alberta and I bonded because I brought her tea every day um, when she performed. And we were both Chicagoans in New York. Um, but at the time I had no sense of her you know history or anything like that it's like in hindsight i'm like oh cool i knew her and i'm putting her in the book but she passed away many years ago but she had a resurgence in her career in her mid 80s i'm familiar with her and i love her so i'm really glad to hear that <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay um so unless somebody else had anything to add to that question, I'll move on to uh, the next question we have. Um, what social mores, coast customs, norms, behaviors do you believe women still face? And does the ethnicity or race of a woman change those mores? Well, I'll start on this one. Um, it sort of pings back to an earlier question as well. I Women were absolutely um, constrained by the laws and the social mores of, of their respective time periods. But one of the things that I think that all of us have found in our uh, historical novels is the ways in which people often negotiated those laws and mores um, and found ways to to resist them, to get around them, or in the actual practice of their, you know, their relationships or their marriages, um, found ways to, uh, to, to do, to behave in different ways. Um, and so uh, I think that one of the things that we all enjoy doing is is both examining the constraint because it does provide the kind of conflict that Mindy that Mindy um, mentioned earlier, but it also then shows the ingenuity and the um, the strength and the courage that people had in working around those constraints, especially when they were unjust. I just wanted to interject here and uh, let everybody know that I can now hear Rita. Rita oh, yes. thank God. Can you, <laughs> can you see me? Can you see I me? I cannot yeah. see you, but it's lovely to hear your voice. Well, I wonder why you can't see me. <laughs> now we have to deal with that. Um, Rita, would you like to go ahead um, and just give a quick introduction for everybody since we weren't able to do that with you earlier? Oh, sure. Um, I think if I... Just give an introduction. All right, I'll give an introduction. Okay. <laughs> My husband was trying to help me. Um, well, let's see. Um, I'm a Frederick County resident and um, a mom of two boys. I'm also a Navy mom. And um, I've been writing since the 90s. And I'm currently on my 14th novel that I'm working on right now. So I don't even have my, my notes with me because <laughs> I wrote things down when I got the questions. So I'm down in the man cave. <laughs> it's good to have tech support for sure. I'm glad yeah. you got Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I'm so sorry. And I have to apologize that I've kind of not, not been able to do this very well. So I don't know where I am. I'm <laughs> somewhere where you can see me, but. Not a problem. Yeah, this is, the, this is what we deal with in the days of Zoom. Yeah. Um, so going back to the question, um, yes. uh, if others would like to contribute, what social mores do you believe women still face? And does the ethnicity or race of a woman change those mores? <clears throat> Do we have other? Well, um, 
I'll um, use one example um, that um, of how for black women in particular, African-American women, black women, mm -hmm. um, recently um, there was a, of course the Oprah Winfrey interview with uh, Harry and Meghan. And some of the pushback was in um, not believing Megan or positioning her as a uh, black woman who's just complaining. And um, that is, you know, having your voice and being able to um, have people um, not dismiss what you have to say automatically because you're a woman or because of the color of your skin is something that definitely historically, I believe is, um, has a place in almost every decade, every century, and um, most recently last week. So um, yeah, I, I think that it does have an impact and it's also, again, something that you can address in your storytelling to show um, those situations and how to overcome them or how to deal with them or how they can put a silence on a woman's voice. A really good example, Denny. Um, I just thought of one from my dear Hamilton that definitely has modern uh, analogies. And that is um, when, uh, when the sort of the story breaks that Alexander Hamilton has had an adulterous affair um, uh, and uh, and the public sort of begins talking about this. The newspapers of the day both criticized Eliza directly um, for staying by her man's side and also for the fact that he had strayed in the first place. So there was really no, um, there was no winning side for her to be on the fact that her famous political husband had had this uh, publicly now known about uh, adulterous affair. And I think we can all think of modern uh, women related to, um, you know, well-known political men uh, who have been criticized because of their husband's um, you know, various uh, untoward activities. And so I, I think that, you know, just just as Denny's example um, did, it often does seem like the more things uh, change, the more they stay the same. I think for those of us who write romance, there's also sort of a meta effect of uh, the role of women in society in that um, romance generally is dismissed as a lesser genre, as a less important genre, certainly as one that doesn't have um, great social statements to make. Um, and it is a genre by women, largely by women, about women, for women. Um, and so we're sort of fighting those social expectations, even as we're writing these books that are uh, pushing boundaries and are changing some of those roles. In my most recent book, in the Women of Chateau Lafayette, one of the heroines is a woman named Beatrice Chandler. And one of the struggles that I had in portraying her is that in the middle of World War I, she left her children and crossed an ocean to deliver war relief to beleaguered soldiers. This was an act of patriotism on her part. She wanted to be part of the war effort. But I knew that readers were going to judge her in a way that I didn't think they would ever judge a man for doing his patriotic duty. So it was a careful line to walk. And I was reminding, reminded of it again just recently by the discussion that's recently been renewed about women in the military and how their service might be perceived as opposed to how the service of men might be perceived in our military. So these issues are perennial. I, I hope they're getting better. I think they're getting better, but um, they're still with us. Rita, we can see you now too. Uh, yeah, you know why? I turned on my Kindle. So I have my Kindle going and I have my husband's computer going. There you go. It works. We can see you on one screen and hear you oh on another. God. So bravo. What a mess, I'll tell you. We've got our bases covered for sure. <laughs> I'll just interject a little something. I wish I had my notes here. Anyway, about the um, 
<clears throat> turn so you can just ignore all the stuff in the back. That's the man cave <laughs> stuff um, <laughs> about the mores and about women and stuff. And um, that the book that I'm writing right now is World War One era. And I learned that in World War One, that was the first time when women could enlist into the military, which I thought was really, really interesting. Since I, I'm a Navy mom, I have a son in the Navy. And um, honestly, the girls, he could tell you, are treated on the same level as the men are. They may not be able to do some of the same things physically, but they can move up in rank. They can have jobs that, you know, and the guys can have. Um, so yeah, a lot of his a lot of his shipmates are are women. So I mean, I know that there's a lot of political opinions about all of this, and we're living in a culture right now where um, this is a big issue and um, things. But personally, for me personally, uh, I love men. <laughs> And, um, you know, I think about my father. He was a World War II veteran. I think about my uncles, my, my son, my, my husband. And there are some really good men out there. Um, and I don't think it's right to lump everybody into one thing. Say, you know, all men are bad. All men are racist or all men are you know, bigots, uh, whatever. I, I just think there's some really great men out there. And, um, you know- I as a, definitely uh, don't think any of us would say that. Oh, well, oh, no, no, I'm not saying you would. I'm saying that there are people out there that do, you know, that, I mean, that I've met and stuff, but yeah. I mean, that's just my, my opinion. So I know think with, I know with like my character, one, one of my characters, in my first book, Images Eternal. Um, she, she was my worldly character. She was the one that had all of the experience. She was the, she's a photographer. And so she goes to these bands. These bands come to her because she has power. And she's, you know, she's perseverant in getting pictures that she wants, you know, and I actually had some reviews going, God, she, you know, she's such a, a witch because she's so aggressive. And I'm like, no, she's going after what she wants and she's succeeding. And I purposely made her that way of she didn't care what people said, because if a guy did this, they probably wouldn't say this. Oh, he's, you know, he's really hopping to it and doing what he needs to do for to make success. And I made her the way of she's very outspoken. She does not have a filter. She tells you what she thinks um, and she knows what she's doing. And you know, I've had some people that absolutely adore her for it. And I have some people that absolutely hate her for it because she doesn't fit into the norm of what a woman should be. And I did it on purpose because mm -hmm. I, I see my daughter in her a lot because my daughter does not take crap from anybody. And if she sees someone else beating up on somebody, she will absolutely step in and go, why are you doing this? You are being rude. You're being arrogant. You need to stop. And I kind of modeled that character after her because she's a strong female. And I was so proud to see the woman that she became because she didn't have any fear of, oh, well, you're not going to fit into society and you're always going to be alone because you're aggressive. And she's like, all right, whatever. <laughs> and I love that. And I hope that in writing characters that we do, whether they're historical, whether they're contemporary, whether they're science fiction fantasy, that we can create characters, both men and female, you know, male and female characters that are out there for the, the good and say, here's how you can be a decent human being and here's how you do it. And I hope that as authors, we do that. And I think we do, especially with this group here. I know you guys do. I think, you know, it's important for us, especially during this month, to celebrate women's accomplishments that doesn't necessarily, it, it, well, actually, it is not denigrating uh, men during this month. Um, and, I, and it makes me remember, too, that uh, in all of the historical fiction books that I've written recently, they're all about women who are part and parcel of a fantastic founding father's legacy. So, 
I think we always find women in those areas uh, adjacent to power or in power. And I love exploring that. That's very true. I love Dolly Madison. How about her? <laughs> you may be coming. She, next. Huh? <laughs> what? I'm sorry. Maybe coming up next with us. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, she, what, uh, the British were coming and they were burning, going to burn down the White House. And she grabbed, uh, what was it, George Washington's um, portrait and a lot of other things. She was, she was really something. I admire her. She's one of those historical figures I like a lot. Following up on what Kira was saying about um, writing women characters who are not necessarily as um, as beloved as uh, or as conventional, um, I think that there's been a, a large number of um, books that sort of started with Gone Girl with very unlikable women um, who are the main characters. Um, the, as a whole line of psychological thrillers um, the, with unreliable narrators and women who you never quite know who they are or what they mean to the story. Um, and I think that readers' um, tolerances have been stretched by those characters and were more willing to follow stories with characters who are not all sunshine and lightness and brightness and kindness. Um, and we're seeing stories in all different genres that are more deep because of that. I like making my villains win once in a while. <laughs> So here's a question to sort of follow up on writing about historical figures. Um, and you wanted, I think, Kira, I think you already um, answered this question. How do you incorporate real people into your writing without damaging what is already known about them? Well, well I was thinking, Denny. oh, go ahead, Laura. No, it's fine. Please, Denny. <laughs> now, I was thinking about that question and sometimes <clears throat> exploring um, historical figures who may have this gloriously, you know, pretty halo over the top of their head, the more research you're willing to dig into, that halo starts to dim. And sometimes that is really interesting storytelling as well. And uh, in um, focusing primarily on um, Black characters as my main protagonist, um, research has a way of revealing or has to be looked at in a certain way because sometimes the information that you're uh, relying on has a different skew because of the writer of that information who may have an attitude toward women, um, people of color, anything that you really do have to dig through a lot of different resources and source material to identify what this character, what this historical figure um, is going to look like on the page that you're writing and the story you're telling. Um, and no, you can't make things up, but you can definitely have a discerning eye. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I agree with all of that. Um, I think that the question predisposes uh, uh, sort of is based on an idea that there is any one shared interpretation of any prominent historical figure. And as an historian, and I think all of us here know this from the research and reading we've done on the people we've written about, um, there's a variety of interpretations that exist among, you know, within the historical field of people who have done research on these people. And um, in writing uh, America's First Daughter, which was the novel of Patsy Jefferson, the eldest daughter of Thomas Jefferson, um, we, we knew that we were dealing with a historical figure in her father who um, a lot of people revered and other people reviled. Um, and, and that there were people who had sort of positions, you know, in between those, uh, they didn't see him as an angel and they didn't see him as a devil. He was somewhere in the middle of that. Um, what that meant for us as writers is that most people were going to come to the novel 
knowing at least something about Thomas Jefferson and probably having some preconceived idea of him. And that meant that no matter what, we were going to be flouting some reader's expectation in how we characterize Jefferson throughout the book. And as a character, of course, he has an arc like Patsy has an arc. No character stays exactly the same throughout the entire book. And it's an arc that we really think um, did characterize the real Jefferson. Uh, and then of course, further compounding how we characterized him was that we were looking at him through his daughter's eyes. And sometimes a child looks at their parent with gratitude and admiration and other times as a parent they know nothing and can do no right um mm -hmm. i have an almost 17 year old and a 14 year old and i'm you know i seem to be moving more from one camp increasingly <laughs> into the into the other one so um i think you know S stephanie and i write a lot of uh, biographical historical fiction which is historical fiction about real people um, and so we think about this a lot. And um, I think that one of the things that we try to do in approaching this question is to start from the actual source material about the person and the existing scholarship about the person that what we do in terms of characterization is grounded in the scholarship and the primary source material and then try to be as true to that as we can be while also doing our job of creating a a great story and, and an emotional arc and so forth for the readers to to go on in a novel. I know for my fantasy series, um, even though it's it's set not on this world, I do a lot of research into battles, like military battles and um, medieval type settings, things like that. And one of the biggest things that I found, and I had to really be aware of this when I was doing research is the victors write the histories. And so when you're dealing with two different, you know, groups that have been fighting, it kind of encouraged my artisticness of, okay, here's the battle, here's, you know, who, here's who won it and here's why they were fighting it. But maybe that's not actually the reason because the person who wrote that history is the one who won it. Um, I had a very profound moment when I was in high school. I grew up in upstate New York, but I went to high school in North Carolina, very different cultures. And it was a little bit of a culture shock to me. And I, I'm really glad I went through it. But I had a history teacher who came in and went, oh, the Civil War was fought because the North wanted what the South had it. And I went, excuse me, I'm 16 years old and I'm fighting with my history professor <laughs> because what I had read and what he believed were two completely different things. And when I started looking into some of the things, some of his points were right, some of them were very wrong, but it got into the whole thing of there's two sides to a story, but you might not always research and find the true reasons, or you might get pieces and parts and you have to kind of put them together. So it's always very interesting when you look into the past and in the history of, you have to kind of keep in the back of your head of, am I getting the whole story? And sometimes you're not. One of the challenges for me in writing very um, recent historical fiction, if you will, um, set last year, um, it was in choosing, because we all are the victors of our own stories there, where we all have our own um, perception of who was right and who was wrong in specific things dealing, especially with how the virus has been handled. Um, and I ended up making decisions um, about some characters to include and not to include um, on the basis that I didn't want 50% of my readership to immediately reject whatever I had said. I wanted to give them a chance to at least begin to hear my story without it being overtly political. Um, I was able to do that because I wasn't writing about um, for example, Trump's daughter, um, if I were going to take the um, Thomas Jefferson example, um, I, I had some more leeway there, but there were very conscious decisions that were made as to um, which actual historical figures, contemporary figures would be included in the narrative. Uh, 
Okay, I think we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, question for all of you. What would be considered your writing kryptonite? Kryptonite. You're writing crypt kryptonite, right? Mm hmm You're writing kryptonite. Would be stress. <laughs> stress is mine. Um, I have a hard time concentrating on writing if there's a whole lot of stuff going on. And um, I like the peace, more peaceful atmosphere where I can sit down and concentrate on my characters. And so if there's a stre stressful moment going on, it's that's that's when I step away um, from the computer. I have to deal with whatever's going on. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, a well-researched fact that I've spent hours and hours finding. And now maybe because Laura tells me I should cut it out, <laughs> I now decide that I have to restructure the whole scene so that I can keep this one factoid. <laughs> Uh, I have I have done this before at least once on the color of grapes in uh, in another novel about Pompeii and ancient Rome, but um, <laughs> but that kind of thing is definitely my writing kryptonite because you get very invested in these darlings. If you had to open all those tabs, it's going in the book. <laughs> yeah, one um, of my one of my favorite comments. Uh, well. Sometimes favorite, favorite to give and least favorite maybe to get is um, this reads like, dear reader, I did hours of research to find this fact and therefore <laughs> I am including it in the book whether it needs to be there or not. Like, so you you can see that in other people's writing sometimes. And then when someone says it to you, you're like, but I did do hours <laughs> of research for this little fact. For me, I think it's probably procrastination is my biggest uh, kryptonite. And probably one of my favorite forms of procrastination is coming up with other book ideas that are not the book that I'm actually supposed to be focusing on in this moment. Again, since I am um, relatively new to the publishing side of writing books, the thing that I call kryptonite right now is debut author dumb um, because it's exciting and very um, it, more intense than I thought it would be because there are so many things going on at the same time and um, what's been exciting about Wild Women in the Blues and surprising is it's generated a lot of buzz but then you start to crave Bu buzz. <laughs> then you start to read Goodreads reviews like all the time. I mean, there are all of these things that I swear I will give up after March 30th when the book comes out. And then I will be a normal writing machine um, and just get everything done and not fall into any other traps except for that synopsis business, which they still editors still like to see that I don't know it just it'll happen but trust me <laughs> and a lot of publishers right now are asking for um proposals and okay. you know you, you have your synopsis to write which you know that's challenging in itself but then when you have to write a full proposal for a book to, in order to sell it to an editor that's that can be pretty challenging, but probably more so than um, doing a synopsis. But the way that I have been able to get around that kind of stuff where, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, it can be very stressful, but is to just have fun with it, you know, and just to go with the flow and enjoy it. Um, because the being a writer is, um, you know, it, it is, it's a joyful time, you know, to be able to sit down and write a story. So if you have to write a synopsis, if that's what they want, just enjoy it. Enjoy the ride. For that's me, the, to get um, over the kryptonite. <laughs> for me, the kryptonite is um, balancing all of the different aspects of what we do. Um, because I spend about half my time writing 
but I spend another half mm -hmm. the time doing the research that we've talked about, doing the um, promoting books, um, sessions like this, um, mentoring new authors. Um, there, I, I could spend 100% of my time in my writing career and never write another word. Um, and so actually dividing up the time so that I actually get books written and out there um, ends up being the major challenge. Yeah, following what Mindy said, um, un unlike many of my co my authors here, um, I work full time. I, I have a day job and it demands a lot of my time. Specifically, I work with uh, EMS, which is emergency medical personnel. And especially in this particular time, our demands are extremely high right now. So my kryptonite is probably making sure and, and really making sure that I'm carving out time for myself to write. And that I, it's been a struggle. It has been a very distinct struggle of, you need to go writing. Oh, but I got to go do this. No, you need to write. No, but I got to go do, and it's like forcing myself to, you need to write and this time is your writing time and thankfully my husband has been phenomenal and he's like okay this is your writing time go lock your door i'm going to leave you alone i'm not going to bother you i'm not going to talk to you if the house is on fire i'll send you a text going you might want to get out of the house <laughs> but other than that i'll leave you alone and that's been i think my hardest thing is finding that like mindy was saying that balance of Yes, I have to work to feed my family, but I have to write to feed my soul. And finding and making sure that I take that time is, is hard. But I've been getting better, I'm working on it. It's a work in progress. One of the things I didn't add about kryptonite, it uh, happens to be marketing. Um, and not because I fear marketing. Mm -hmm. I spent 20 years as a marketing professional and I loved it. And so <laughs> what I am sometimes challenged by is that once I get going on the marketing thing, I'm like, oh yeah, let's do this, let's do that. And having to recognize and realize those things I don't need to do from the things the publicist does from, and publicists these days are, are working a little harder um, then the rumor mill used to, I used to say, oh, they do nothing. I disagree. <laughs> but uh, that's something that is a challenge for me is that going back to the old love affair that I've had with marketing and public relations and social media platforms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I could go on and on with that. <laughs> and then I don't write as write when I should be writing. Yeah, I hear that all the time from writers, that marketing is probably their biggest challenge. They love writing their stories, but then when it comes to the marketing, it's like the bane of every author there, that's out there, unless you have a publicist, but not everybody can afford that. So the authors that I know, you know, they're winging it on their own as far as marketing it goes. So... But that can be a good time too. Oh, I love marketing. Yeah, it, it can Which, be one, a wonderful time. It could be a lot of fun. You yeah. Know, there's all kinds of stuff, all kinds of neat things you can do to Absolutely. get the word out. So, want to do mine, Denny? <laughs> <laughs> I don't work with authors. <laughs> that, that's my one rule. <laughs> Wise woman. <laughs> yeah, Lee, crazy pants. <laughs> Okay, um, <clears throat> I don't believe, um, Lynette, have we received any um, additional questions in the Q&A or in the comments on Facebook? Uh, not at this time. Okay, um, I think we might, if you would like to, I think we have one more, we can probably squeeze in one more question. Um, what's your favorite underappreciated novel that you find yourself recommending to friends and fans to read? And what are you reading right now for enjoyment? I'm not sure if this is as quick as it should be, but I'm right? going to that's a toughie. <laughs> hmm. Um, I'll pull up two very quickly because I have them right here. Um, 
this book, oh my goodness gracious, I love it a lot. It is called The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, Taylor Jenkins Reid. I'm enjoying that tremendously. I'm also reading a book that was written in the 30s, I believe, called Passing mm. by Nella Larson. Um, and this is about a black woman who uh, passes for white and <clears throat> was written early part of the 20th century. So, did they make, uh, Jenny, did they make a movie out of that? I believe there was um, a movie in the- There were movies made the uh, 30s in or... the 30s and 40s and 50s. Um, I wouldn't call them this, about this particular book. I'd call them books that, I mean, films oh. that I recall from the 30s, 40s and 50s that sensationalized um, the topic. Um, oh, okay. Trying to remember one in particular that was very popular during its day. It was, um, um, yeah. I can't remember because I'm an old film, I'm an old movie fan. Me and, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. Um, I don't remember. I can't recall the title of the film either. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was this along the same lines of that. Yeah. Oh, definitely. It was the subject yeah. matter was similar, yeah. but yeah. Um, it's not this mm -hmm. book. Yeah. I'd like to read that. Go for it. <laughs> Nella yeah. Larson is a passing the author, yeah. and the name of the book is Passing yeah. and written in, which I find by Pen. Oh, well, it's not popping out at me, but I know it was in the 1920s or 30s. Even better. <laughs> I love the old books. Yeah. Well, I'll jump in. Um, <laughs> the book that I would recommend that's, you know, kind of a lesser known novel was written in the 90s, I believe. I don't have it sitting here with me, but it's called The Authentic History of Jenny Dorset. It's by Philip, no, Philip, William Lee Phillips. And it is so funny and humorous. It's about a girl that lives in North Carolina during the um, rise of the American Revolution. And the story is told from the viewpoint of their butler you know and it's it's hilarious it's a great great book my um brother-in-law was here the other day and he saw it on the shelf and he grabbed it um because him and his wife they read to each other at night and he said i read this a long time ago can i borrow it again you know so i said as long as you give it back because <laughs> it's one of my favorites um i'm currently i just started reading the winthrop woman by um anya seaton it was written in the 50s. It's a historical novel. And I'm also reading one that probably, I never heard of this author, but um, it's called In Another Girl's Shoes. And it was written in 1916 by Bertha Ruck. And it's another, to me, it's <laughs> historical because it takes place right as the end of World War One, And, you know, so it's 100 years of, back and it's it's another one of those humorous humorous stories and so so that's what I'm into right now and I'm going to get ready to read Jane Eyre again so, so I'll go next um I think that uh an, an underrated or um not as widely read book as it should be would be um Stephanie Thornton's historical novel about Jackie Kennedy um, that is called, and, and we called it Camelot, that um, came out almost exactly a year ago, right before the pandemic hit, before, um, you know, stores and libraries uh, and, and other venues were well situated to do a lot of this kind of promotion. And so her novel got caught a little bit in that in that gap um, when all the events got canceled um, and uh, and yet this kind of thing wasn't as widely available. So um, a really, really great, compelling, well-researched novel about Jackie <clears throat> Kennedy. Um, and so uh, I highly recommend that one and, and um, encourage you to go check that one out. And then um, what I'm reading right now, let me see if I can make this work. Uh, yeah, okay, mostly, 
is no. called um, The Things We Leave Unfinished by Rebecca Yeros, which is a contemporary romance with a World War II romance subplot. Um, and so for me, it was sort of a really fun catnip of um, a fun romance novel mixed with uh, World War II fiction, which is what my current novel that I'm writing is about. So I'm interested in all things World War II. And, uh, and so that's my current read that I also recommend. I really have to second Laura's recommendation on Stephanie Thornton's uh, Jackie Kennedy book. It was just great. And I, I thought it was, you know, destined for, for to be a household name. And then the pandemic hit and kind of crushed it. So it, it needs some more attention. Right now I'm reading um, a book called Anxious People. And I've been desperately trying to remember the, the name of the author. He Frederick wrote, Bachman. Thank yeah. you. He wrote, wrote a man called Uva. And it is extremely funny and not, his, not exactly historical, but... Um, I'll let you know how it turns out, maybe. <laughs> well, that's very funny because I was going to say another Frederick Backman book. Uh, my grandmother told you to tell me, uh, to tell you she's sorry, um, which um, is one of those books that had me actively laughing out loud repeatedly. I, I was reading it with my husband in the room and he kept saying, you're really enjoying that book, aren't you? Um, so I think Backman must be in the air right now. I have been doing a lot of beta reading recently for mm -hmm. several friends. Um, so I had, don't have any current reads. Um, I just finished a couple beta mm -hmm. reads and I'm kind of like, when does this book come out? I really want to start telling people about this book because it's really, really good. <laughs> awesome. Okay, I'm sure, um, is there anyone else that uh, wanted to contribute to that question? Okay, I thought that we had gotten everybody. Um, I'm sure that we could definitely go on with this discussion for at least another hour, but we are kind of just past time. Thank you so much to our authors for joining us today. Again, if you are interested in any of their books, they are available. Most of them are available here with the library. Um, and you can also purchase them from our community partner in downtown Frederick, the Curious Iguana. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Lynette, if I could just say one thing. Of course, um, go ahead. The, the bookstore, uh, Curious Guana, isn't carrying my books. So if anybody wants to um, get one of my books, best thing would be to go to, to one of the online bookstores or Barnes & Noble, Frederick. So that's where they could get them. And they're at the library, too. Sounds good. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much for adding Thank that. You. It's appreciated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you for having us. This was great. Oh, and I should give a quick shout out to Chris Buecher, who designed this program and did a really wonderful job with it. Thank you. Did. So much. Yay. Thank you, Chris. <laughs>